Okay, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If you'd like to welcome the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament and the Right Honourable Harriet Harman, MP. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ken McIntosh. I'm the presiding officer here at the Scottish Parliament, and uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to this. This is our, our 13th annual festival of politics, so thank you all for coming along. And um, this is an audience participation event, so we'll be asking you to join in, uh, and not only here, but actually we're on Facebook Live. Um, so we'll be asking our audience on Facebook also to, to ask questions. So, in fact, uh, I would uh, just encourage you if you wish to continue to throw your thoughts out you can do so by using the hashtag FOP 2017 that's uh, Festival of Politics 2017 hashtag FOP 2017 got to do these hashtags uh, so I'm very pleased today to be joined by one of Britain's leading politicians uh, twice deputizing as leader of the Labour Party the country's longest serving female MP the right honorable Harriet Harman QC MP now officially the mother of the house and served your constituency of Camberwell and Peckham since 1982. So after studying politics at York University, Harriet and her sisters followed in their mother Anna's footsteps with all three qualifying as solicitors. Harriet worked for the Progressive Brent Law Centre in London in the 70s, where she dealt with high profile trade union actions and the first cases under the Equal Pay and Sexual Discrimination Acts. Harriet met her husband, trade union leader, and later the MP, Jack Dromey, in 1977. And they have two boys, Harry and Joseph, and a daughter, Amy. In fact, Harriet was the first ever candidate to be elected into the House of Commons while pregnant, at a time when the House of Commons was 97% male. And I think we'll return to that issue. So she's still campaigning for a comprehensive system of baby leave and cover for women and men who have a baby. And I think you've been making uh, great progress in, that in the last week or so, in fact. Appointed Secretary of State for Social Security in 1997 and the first ever Minister for Women, she has also been Solicitor General, Leader of the House of Commons, Lord Privy Seal and Minister of State in the Department of Constitutional Affairs, Ministry of Justice and the Government Equalities Office. In addition to her ministerial positions, Harriet has held many other key political posts including shadow ministerial posts in work and pensions, health and international development as well as party chair. Throughout her political career, Harriet has fought for more female representation in Parliament. She championed the introduction of women-only shortlists, which resulted in a record-breaking 101 female Labour MPs being elected in 1997, and remains one of politics' most prominent champions for women's rights, changing laws on childcare, domestic violence and maternity rights. Now, despite de denouncing political memoirs, I believe, as male vanity projects, Harriet's autobiography, a woman's work. <laughs> Harriet's autobiography, a woman's work, was published earlier this year, and the memoir gives a fascinating insight into the Labour Party, uh, the way the country has been governed since the 1970s, and Harriet's efforts to bring uh, women's issues to the heart of the Labour Party and to government leaps off every single page. So I'm delighted to introduce you to Harriet Harman, QC MP. Now, I, I'm going to return to the book shortly and perhaps go through some of your career, but I wonder if I might just start with the, the issue that's been dominating the news for almost two weeks now, and that's Harvey Weinstein. Um, are, are you, I don't know, shocked, discouraged, amazed, um, depressed that such a story, which sounds the sort of story that would have been in the news when you entered politics in 1982, should still be leading the news today? Mm. Um, well, um, thanks very much for inviting me up here. And it's always fantastic to be up in Edinburgh and great to see you all and the sun is shining and it's great to be here. And um, uh, the first thing to mention about my memoirs is that I had to, it is true that the men's memoirs are male vanity projects, <laughs> honestly. Um, and I did used to think, oh, you know, we're, we're sitting in a meeting, we're in the shadow cabinet, we're trying to get rid of Thatcher out of government. And they're writing, I've just made such an important point and I'm wearing my new suit today. And, um, <laughs> and I'm thinking, 
shouldn't we be focusing on trying to, you know, wrest power out of the hands of the Thatcherites? And then it, it carried on in Cabinet. I'd be sitting there and something would be happening on the NHS or the global financial crisis and um, everybody agreed with this point that I made would be written. And I would be like thinking, this is really not what we're here there for. However, when my colleagues all wrote their memoirs, you know, Alistair, Alistair, Peter, Peter, Jack, you know, all of them would write their memoirs. And I would like look at the photographs in the middle in the bookshop the way one does. There would be no pictures of women except if they were married to them or working for them. And actually, that is not the story of women's politics over the last 30 years or women's lives. And I thought, well, if I don't write the story of the amazing, transformative social and political change that has happened in women's lives, which has affected everything, well, it will be completely invisible. You know, Sheila Rowbottom did that book, Hidden from History. So really, I felt it was my duty to write my memoirs, which is why I did, because it's all of your stories. I can see many of you who are my age. It is our story of being part of that great women's movement, which wrought such an amazing progressive transformation. However, Harvey Weinstein. Um, and actually, um, in... When I was a student at York University, um, and I was uh, in my third year, my tutor um, called me in and he said, oh, you're very borderline, 2-1, uh, 2-2, two, two, but it will definitely be a 2-1 if you sleep with me. And I, you know, he was absolutely repulsive and I had no hesitation of like exiting the room and I thought, well, if it's got to be a 2-2, so be it. But what I later discovered, a few years later, was that another young woman who'd been on my course, who came from a working-class background, she was the first in her um, family to go to university from a small town where her progression was very much watched by everybody, um, she felt she couldn't afford to have a 2-2, that she had to get a 2-1, and had to submit to him. And, and actually, we had no concept of the idea that you could complain. I mean, who would you complain to? All the other lecturers were his friends. They would all side with him. He would deny it. I would be regarded as a troublemaker. I mean, you didn't even go through the thought process of what to do about it. It was also, you felt it was disgusting and you just not want to think about it. Or for her, feeling uh, really conflicted because she did actually have sex with him and therefore wanted to not think about it at all, let alone talk about it and complain about it. And I think that with the Harvey Weinstein thing, it is a classic thing of uh, men abusing their power in a situation where women are wanting to go into this particular sphere of work and there's a, a, a male hierarchy. And of course, the overwhelming majority of men wouldn't dream of sexually abusing a woman further down the system, but some will. And the power that they have gives them impunity, which means that they do it again and again and again. So what we've got at the moment is two things happening. Firstly, people thinking, Harvey Weinstein is one evil person. No, he is not. It is absolutely endemic. And secondly, that there's nothing we can do about it except wring our hands. Or thirdly, it's somehow women's fault for not complaining. Or even in Harvey Weinstein's case, somebody said it was Angelina Jolie's fault, for heaven's sake. Well, actually, we need to do more than blame women or wring our hands and think there's nothing we can do about it. And I think that the absolute key to it, when I think about my own experience and think about the Harvey Weinstein thing, is that we need a system of, like, whistleblowing, anonymous whistleblowing. Because if there had been that system in place at my university, I would have got on that whistleblowing line straight away and that doesn't necessarily mean they can instantly hold the perpetrator to account, but it means it would like create a hot spot because there would be some where actually, you know, there'd be like a, a sort of hot spot around them. And if you think of like with Jimmy Savile, if people have been able to complain anonymously about Jimmy Savile to a kind of sex abuse helpline, 
loads of people would have done it. And he wouldn't have then been able to carry on for decades because the next time somebody complained and were prepared to go on the record, everybody would know that actually this was happening. So I think that so long as that individual victim, who after all has been sexually abused because they're vulnerable, because they're young, because they're trying to find their way into the system, if it depends on the victim to sort this out, it will publicly, it will never be sorted out. We need a whistleblowing system. It needs to be anonymous so that those patterns can be seen because it is never only one woman. It is never only one. If he's going to do it with one woman, he's going to keep trying. Um, and once he's done it and succeeded, he'll just carry on. So it's never only one. We need to establish those patterns and it needs to be done anonymously. So I think we need to all work together to insist that that is what happens, that we have an anonymous whistleblowing system for this. Uh, thanks. The, 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 I think all of us have been shocked by this story. And as I say, perhaps we shouldn't be shocked that it's, no. you know, when it's so endemic. But the, the, the situation you describe, and I, I mentioned it because it, this idea of, um, uh, of for example, se sexually predatory men abusing their position of power, you talk about it clearly at university. You also refer to it in the legal profession, uh, perhaps not with you, but with other women that you came mm. across. So we're talking about, you know, the brightest, most powerful women in these jobs, the most ambitious, you know, strong women who are standing up for themselves in these professions, and yet they were being taken advantage of. Do you think, I mean, do you think if you were, would a 21-year-old uh, Harriet Harman today, would you have been the one, one of the ones to speak up today? You know, because you found it difficult then. Well, I think the, the thing about the Harvey Weinstein thing, if, if, if any woman would have made an accusation, an individual 21-year-old woman, she would have been sued and driven out of her, uh, her career. I mean, it just wasn't possible. It's only because now that dam has been broken that those numbers are there. So it is just not possible when you've got somebody who is, like, really powerful um, for somebody who is completely powerless to, to take them on. It's a question of power relations. But one thing that, that, that can be done is for all regulators and all hierarchies to have policies, and those policies to include the ability for people to report um, I'm going to take you back then. So I just wanted to start just mm. because it's been so, and, and <clears throat> it's one of the issues that runs through your books, uh, through your book. Um, but it's fair to say that women's rights generally, that, that was the issue that took you into politics. In other words, women's rights came first through your work through uh, the Brent Law Centre, uh, your involvement with uh, equal pay and sexual discriminate sexual discrimination uh, cases early on in your career. That's that was your into politics. Well, my sort of into politics was because of the, all the inequality and injustices which were the norm at the time and feeling that they were unfair and therefore we all needed to, to fight against them. And there were a whole load of progressive movements which were going forward at the time, challenging the status quo. I thought it was interesting, Obama talking about Trump yesterday saying, that was what, you're taking us back to what America was like 50 years ago, because that is absolutely right. And the things that some of you who are old enough will remember that were the conventional wisdom at the time, you know, the rich man in the castle, the poor man at his gate, you know, people had to know their place. You know, the hierarchy was absolutely the status quo um, sort of imposed in a very unequal way. Racism and misogyny were absolutely the norm. When I was first an MP, um, there was um, Guy's Hospital, which was my local hospital, had a rag week, and they had a magazine in the rag week, and it had a joke section. It was like medical students raising money for, for charity and hospital charities. And in this uh, joke section were two, two jokes. One was, um, how do you stop a Pakistani spitting turn down the grill? And the other was, how do you get 100 Jews in a mini one in the driving seat, 99 in the ashtray. Now, there was nothing unusual about this sort of banter, as it was. Now, I was part of these equality movements that were saying, this is not all right, this is totally unacceptable. And I protested to the hospital, to the DPP and everything like that. And um, 
And the South London Press, that was my local newspaper, did an editorial um, saying I had no sense of humour. And that's what was going on at the time. There was so much unfairness. And so I wanted to be part of that great network of movements that there was at the time, which obviously the Labour Party was the political expression of it, of changing all of that and challenging all of that. Indeed. And, and you did that, so you... you you, you, you made networks or you, you discovered others of like mind and that took you into politics itself? Well, or the, women's, the women's movement was all about changing everything and all those things that women couldn't do and be, been told they shouldn't be doing because really at that time, um, the most important thing for a girl, the summit of her aspirations really, was to get a, get a husband, to get a good husband. And then once she'd achieved that marvellous um, aspiration to be a good housewife. And we, the women's movement was saying, no, actually, we can have husbands and, you know, look after homes, but we can also do things outside the home. Um, so, so really, that was the kind of spirit of the time, that we should change everything and challenge it. And that meant being you know, women trying to get into the law, women trying to get into academia, women trying to get into trade union activism, but also into politics and into parliament in order to change the laws and change public policy. So, in a way, there was women in every walk of life, in every region, throughout Scotland, England and Wales, and in every uh, sort of activity, challenging all those barriers. Um, I was actually <coughs> in Edinburgh not so long ago and I met a woman who was in her, um, uh, just in her early 80s, and she said that she'd done her banking exams on leaving school and gone to work in the bank. But when she was 24, she gave it up to get married. And that's what women used to do. The idea was you would give up to get married. And, but then her husband died and she became a widow. And... Um, uh, she went back to the bank um, when she was 50, when he died, but then she was compulsorily retired at 54. So it's like her, you know, the idea that you could actually work outside the home, make something of your work, but also be um, uh, a wife and a mother, you know, that was regarded as not possible. And we were about changing all of that and saying all those things that we were told we couldn't do, we were going to do. You, you were very much dropped in at the deep end, though, because you, as you joined the, the Labour Party and then began to prepare to become a candidate, you found yourself standing as a candidate several months pregnant. And, and if I, I was noticing at the time, I was saying the, the House of Commons was 97% uh, male. There were, there were only 19 women, 19 women in Parliament when you... It's funny, because this is all our Over life. 650, well yeah. yeah. But, but actually, I hadn't intended to stand for Parliament pregnant pregnant and what, what had happened is I'd been selected to stand for what was you know safe Labour seat um, but the man that I was going to be taking over from uh, sadly died so there was a by-election so I would thought that I could be get pregnant have a baby and then the general election would be some way off um, and so what happened was he, suddenly he died when I was like five months pregnant and it was like the elephant in the room. I, we were all thinking, can it be possible for a, a, a young woman to be a candidate, let alone a young woman who's pregnant to be a candidate? But we were all not taking no for an answer on everything. So basically, um, I went ahead with it, but it, it made me be even more of a kind of outgroup. And I remember that moment when I was introduced into the House of Commons, which is a very unlike this lovely, light, airy building, it's a very forbidding uh, place um, and packed on all sides of the House of Commons um, were these 97% men all in their dark suits, um, all making a sort of hell of a noise. And I was standing at the end and you have to stand at the bar while the speaker calls for you to be introduced and then you have to walk down and then three steps bow, then another three steps bow and everything, with everybody looking at you. Which is fine, except for all of them were men in dark suits and I was like in a red velvet maternity dress. And I felt 
utterly out of place. And they all thought, what on earth is she doing here? Because their model of a woman was a wife and a mother, not a colleague. The colleagues were men. And I think it was a bit disturbing for quite a lot of them, because actually the idea that a woman could be doing that, well, it just didn't feel normal or comfortable. And I had hoped that after that by-election, that in 1983, where so many women had been selected in Labour seats as part of the whole drive of the women's movement, that, that we would then be a small but determined troop. But Labour did so badly in the 1983 general election that they didn't get elected. So I found myself continuing to be very much on my own. And as far as Scotland was concerned, out of 50 Labour MPs we had in the late 80s, 90s, one woman, one woman, firstly um, Judith Hart, um, who was wonderful to me, actually, really wonderful, but just one. The idea that all the women in Scotland could be spoken up for by just one woman. Um, so now, you know, things have really changed um, and we've got a critical mass, but it was pretty, pretty tough. Is it, some of the battles are still going on. I mean, you, you had your first child as you were being elected, or just after being elected, and then you've had and three children since then, but you're still fighting a battle today to get baby leave for yeah. women MPs. That's going on right now. I mean, now. I know here that you've got rules for, um, uh, in Holyrood for um, if a MP has a baby. And of course, in, in times gone by, the question of leave after a baby would have been irrelevant for two reasons. Firstly, because there were hardly any women and those women who were there were older. They'd had their families and then kind of advanced into parliament, the handful that there were, that were older. So it was irrelevant for them. But also the idea that a man should show any interest in his baby was a completely foreign concept. And I remember once being in a committee and um, a, a male colleague uh, had his pager on and he jumped up and he said, on a point of order, Mr. Chair, I've just had a baby. And everybody went, oh, here, 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 here. And I thought, God, you know. And then he sat down and carried on with the committee. And I thought, but now men expect are an, and are expected to, not Jacob Rees-Mogg, but other men, uh, <laughs> expect and are expected to take an interest in their children and share the responsibility of their children. And there are loads of women who are younger women, and it's a fact of life that they're actually having babies. But there is no maternity provision at all. So there is like a pretense. The pretense is that the constituency has 24-7 cover from their MP. And actually, you cannot be looking out for your constituents' interests when you're in labour. And you shouldn't be looking out for your constituents' interests if you've got a baby who's just a few weeks old. We need an actual system, and currently the system, uh, well, is, doesn't, it's not really a system, but what actually happens is that you can go along to the WHIP's office and they will then allow you some leave but it's but for a, a new young MP to have to go to the whips office is quite and to kind of then individually kind of sort of negotiate and then be beholden to the whips for having granted the favor of letting you have time off with your baby it's not the right way to do it um, so we're we're proposing um, a system of baby leave and um, the SNP are backing it, and uh, as well as obviously Labour strongly backing it. And one of the, the things that I've been wanting to emphasise very much with my little trip up here today is that we need to kind of rekindle the spirit of sisterhood across the border. So I'm wanting the SNP to vote with me on some changes that um, need to happen in rape cases. And I know there's a, they take the constitutional view that they're not going to vo vote on what issues which are purely devolved issues. But we need their support to get this change on rape. And I don't want constitutional niceties to mean that men continue to get away with rape because they're able to throw women's sexual history into the, uh, into the trial and then besmirch her name and then blacken her character and, and then get off. So, so basically... Um, we need, to, uh, we need to be having that solidarity across the border. 
that, that in, in this case, you're talking about a law that the, the law doesn't apply. The law is different here in Scotland. And but you have the same can't. problem. It's matching. It is actually the um, uh, matching. We still you have the same problem. Scottish Women's Aid um, report that in something like 70 percent of cases, uh, rape cases, that the defence will raise the issue of the previous sexual history of the complainant. And this is based on the idea that it can make the jury think, well, if she's had sex with all these people before, she's bound to have consented to have sex with him. Or if she's the sort of woman that's had sex with lots of people, she's kind of sort of immoral, so can't be believed. And it's to build prejudice up. And it's just prejudicial. It doesn't give you any evidential value about what actually happened at the time. So really, here in Scotland, you need to be making that change as well. So... You know, we're very supportive of the change being made up in Scotland, but we need Scotland to help us change the law in, the, in England and Wales as well. Yes, the number of prosecutions for rape is, is tiny here as well. But you, you're, not, you're not setting up feminism against nationalism in that sense. That's... Uh, yes, probably a little bit, because <laughs> basically I don't want nationalism to trump feminism. Is that actually the, the history of women's advance in Scotland, England and Wales is that we've all worked together. And I remember in Edinburgh where the zero tolerance um, uh, theory was like promulgated and that was very pioneering. And we then borrowed that and built on that. I remember, uh, I mean, incidentally, when I was a girl growing up, the idea of a man hitting his wife, well, it was what she obviously bought it on herself or actually needed to hit her to keep her in order. So basically, the idea of zero tolerance was very, very pioneering. And we supported the women in Edinburgh and then borrowed from, from the work they were doing in Strathclyde Regional Council. They pioneered the notion of universal childcare being part of the public services, and we built on that. And actually, you know, we shouldn't let the border um, weaken that, that sense of solidarity of women uh, and working together um, because we, we're, str we're not strong enough to do it on our own. We need to be able to work together to, to get change. Uh, I'm going to continue just that theme, but just uh, at this stage, if anyone wants to catch my eye and wants to ask a question themselves, um, hopefully along the same themes, but um, uh, and, and as we continue, we'll broaden out to other issues. So just catch my eye and I'll bring you in in, in two seconds. I'll see you the first up. So... Um, but after you, after you had, after you were elected and you were pregnant, I mean, I was quite shocked reading your book, the, the letters you received, um, basically saying that you were, this, you were going to be an unfit mother. I mean, well, it was basically, when you get elected in a by-election, which is a very high-profile event, you get a whole sack full of mail awaiting for you, emails, I suppose, nowadays, but um, when you arrive. So you arrive at the House of Commons and I had this huge sack full of mail and half of it was from women saying, fantastic, great, you know, right behind you, get on with it. And half was from women saying, what are you doing? You are going to ruin your children. They will truant from school. And the problem with that is that I couldn't be sure that that wasn't true because my family circumstance had been my mother being at home and there wasn't any sense really that what would happen if you actually really pushed the envelope and was out in the public domain and actually one of the things that I do write about in the book and that has characterized uh, my working life is a real sense of maternal anxiety and guilt as to whether or not you really can be going out to work, um, committing yourself to your work, putting in all the hours, going that extra mile, and whether or not that is ruinous for your children. I think at such point when we have men taking an equal share of parenting, at which point we are not at yet, but when we're at that point, then I think that women won't feel so uh, guilty and anxious because they will at least have somebody doing the equal sharing with them and presumably they'll equally share the guilt and anxiety that inevitably comes with parenting. But, you know, it was seen very much as the responsibility of the woman to, to be there and care for the children. And so when I got those letters, and I do, do remember them, uh, in fact, I've still got them. Being a lawyer, I keep every bit of paper I've ever had. Um, 
I look at them and think, you know, they like an icy hand gripped my heart yeah. at that moment, supposing they're right. No, that, I have to say, it's one of the most shocking things reading your book that comes across that sense still of, of, of guilt, which, you know, everyone you must recognise as, as unfair. I think perhaps surprising as well, given your achievements. But perhaps I could just bring in this woman here first, and I've got hands going up all over the place. Just here, yeah. um, hello. I think um, it's very shocking, the stuff about baby leave not being um, in, present at the moment in Parliament. But, and it's um, encouraging to hear that there's a critical level of female MPs, and especially in Scottish leaders, that there have been more females. But on the ground, there does still seem to be an issue, the gender pay gap, is wide. It's almost 10% recently um, announced by a large public service broadcaster. Um, and yet it's, it just goes away unremarked, almost like they're doing quite well because it's not as big as elsewhere. Um, Childcare still falls on the female's head majorly. These things seem to just be continuing without much um, momentum being gathered. Do you see any improvement in that in the future? Is there more that female politicians should be doing to really focus people's minds on uh, resetting the clock and saying this is not really acceptable? Mm. Well, I think that, you know, we've spent an awful lot of energy and effort and with some success for getting into positions of decision making, you know, to get into different areas of work, to, to break down those barriers, to end all male decision making across the board. But I think that what we've got to be thinking of now is actually upping our demands. You know, we're like, now we're in the room. Um, and I think that there's been a bit of a, because every time we've made a demand, it's been regarded as totally unreasonable and accompanied by a huge backlash together with helpings of personal abuse. Um, it rather creates a self-limiting self-censorship um, thing. And I think that one of the things that we've got to do is now really think we have made a lot of progress and we have got into a lot of fora and what are we going to do there in terms of what is not what is possible for us to do or we might be able to do but what we is necessary for us to do and be not asking but demanding and not sort of proposing but insisting because there is still a whole load more change that needs to happen. I mean, childcare, women are still tearing their hair out about childcare. And there is a still a natural order of progression at work whereby you're all on equal terms until the babies come along, then her hours drop down and his increase to make up the income. And then when she goes back to work, um, you know, she's regarded as less committed, less experienced. And so it's all entrenched. Um, so I do think that we have got to take stock of where we've got to and then up our demands and recognise that there's never been a demand that the women's movement have made that hasn't started off as being regarded as out, uh, uh, outrageous and unreasonable. But like today's unreasonable demand is tomorrow's conventional wisdom. So we've got to like decide what is necessary and then really go for it and support each other um, when, when we do so. I've got two hands up here. I'm not sure it's the same question. Or, but I'll, can I take both of you? One after that. Carol first. Yeah. Harriet, I very much enjoyed your book, but it seemed to me almost a book of two halves. I really related to the first half where you were a feisty solicitor almost getting yourself struck off and taking <laughs> on the world. But it seems almost sometimes when you were then elected you did pull your punches. And one example that struck me in the book was when Tony Blair turned up for the all-female photo shoot. And you didn't tell me, just jog on, Tony. This isn't your day. <laughs> because you, you, and there are other examples in the book where you're concerned to be nice to people or, you know, that there just seems to be a compromise made where you did take no for an answer where the younger part of Harriet might not have done that. And perhaps I wish that, I don't know whether you've been worn down by it because as a strong woman, it is very difficult. And just lastly, the Labour Party and feminism. I think we'll get more sisterhood in Scotland when the Labour Party is finally honest about their record and equal pay in Scotland. Well, I, I think you've I made a really, too. really uh, sort of um, uh, perspicacious um, point. Um, and I think that if you're a pioneer and all women who are in a minority 
uh, and still women in politics, are pioneering. They're kind of new into territory, which is customarily male, is that you're always trying to make judgments about how far you can push things um, or whether or not it's right to be pushing things. I mean, I'll just give a, a couple of examples in addition to the photograph issue. One was when I'd become deputy leader, you know, um, and I was succeeding John Prescott, who'd been deputy leader, elected deputy leader of the Labour Party, and as a result of being deputy leader, was deputy prime minister. It sort of automatically went with the post. But Gordon Brown didn't make me deputy prime minister. And I should have actually, you know, banged the table, marshes, marshaled the forces of the sisterhood of women and said, you've got to do this. But actually, I didn't. And the context was that Tony and Gordon had been having lots of well-publicised rows. The Labour Party generally felt quite uneasy about the idea of the two leading figures in the party arguing with each other. Um, it was very disturbing for the party to have that turbulence at the top. Plus also, Gordon Brown was taking over as new Prime Minister. I wanted him to succeed. This was a Labour government after all, and it's difficult to transition from one Prime Minister to another. So I was busy thinking, well, it is outrageous, but I, I, the most important thing is that we have a good transition between Tony and Gordon, and that Gordon doesn't become vulnerable to all the people who were Tony supporters that actually wanted to do Gordon in. And I looked at the bigger picture, and actually what I should have done is looked at the bigger picture, which is, it's downright wrong for when a woman gets to be elected as deputy leader, she doesn't get made deputy prime minister. Um, another example was when we had the G20, there was the global financial crisis, you know, Obama was over, um, Angela Merkel was over, Barroso was over from the EU, and, you know, everybody was gathering for the G20, which was the summit, and it was in Downing Street, and um, uh, my office was saying, oh, we've just got the invite for all the number 10 G20 summit dinner. So I said, oh, well, that's great, just put it in the diary, and they said, but it's not great. So I said, why? They were looking all ashen face and they said, because you've been invited to the wives dinner. And it was like, oh God. So then a big ideological discussion had to happen in the office, which is, shall I just say, I'm not going to go along to the wives dinner, which seems to not express solidarity with women. But I wasn't a wife, or should I be saying, I'm coming along to the man's dinner? I mean, it was just absolutely ridiculous. But I thought, I didn't want to like be looking as though I'm saying to the women, I'm better than you. Um, so there was that. But also, we were in the middle of a global financial crisis, and where I ate my dinner didn't feel like I could make that. And yet it was those things all add up to being important. And therefore, you've got to step back and look from the outside and think, well, it might be in some way a small thing, but it is actually quite important. And another example is like when I was first elected in 2007 as deputy leader, and I'd been in the cabinet previously, so I know that the deputy sits on one side of the prime minister, on the other side sits the head of the civil service, opposite sits the chancellor of the exchequer, on one side the home secretary, on the other side the foreign secretary. The power is choreographed, absolutely. How near you sit to the prime minister, whether you're in the prime minister's eye line, and then all the people who are regarded as completely less important are right down the end of the table and they can't be seen or heard and they're almost like a, you know, on the terrace. Um, so I came in expecting to be like, and I just as I was lowering myself into the seat, I realised they put name tags because it was a new cabinet and therefore lots of the people who were first time in the cabinet wouldn't have known where the foreign secretary sits or the home secretary or, you know, wherever sits. So, and I realised the name on it was Jack Straw. And it's like, it should have been my name. Uh, it was like a sort of Goldilocks moment. That was my seat next to the Prime Minister, and flipping out, Jack Straw was going to be sitting in it. And I anxiously looked around all the name tags, and mine was virtually outside the room, right at the end. And what I should have done is I should have actually... Um, I thought to myself, well, this is the first um, meeting of Gordon Brown's cabinet his new cabinet, 
And I can't be saying, before we discuss the new business of the government, can we just discuss where I'm sitting? You know, it just seems like trivial, and yet it's a message about power and authority. And what I should have done is said afterwards, by the way, Jack, buzz off out of that seat, it's mine. And actually, you enjoyed it for one meeting, but I'm going to be there next time. And just told the civil service and told Gordon that's where I was going to be sitting. And the thing is that you want to be teamly. You want to make sure that the bigger picture is working. But you've got to be vigilant all the time that you're not letting things go by, which send out the signal that somehow you are prepared to be slighted in a way that men make difficulties if they are, so therefore it happens less. So when I look back over the long period, I led with my chin on a whole load of issues and had like so many rows every single day. Some issues I didn't have rows about, but that was not because I wasn't having rows about loads of others, but I put those in the book to just show that we're all the time having to make a judgment because when you're in that sort of hostile climate, make a wrong judgment and then you can mobilise everybody against you and then you can find you can do nothing because you're pushed out of the door completely, um, as being easy, unreasonable. It's easy to see how you could also, your own reputation would be damaged because you'd be seen, you'd be displayed or portrayed as precious rather mm. than actually fighting. Self-seeking, yeah. 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 You know, somebody would brief to the newspapers that I'd exactly. made a fuss about where I was sitting, you know. You're in a perilous situation always. Indeed. But I should have done And that. your colleague, just uh, neighbour. Um, thank you. Some of us here are involved with the Scottish Commission on Women, which is trying to identify and address some of the institutional and the attitudinal barriers that get in the way of women trying to progress through the workforce, particularly as we hit our 50s and 60s. And um, we don't really have any resources, but we have a partnership with um, Edinburgh University. And one of the things that came up in the most recent piece of research was that many women don't actually manage to get selected for interview um, for, for jobs at that stage in their career. Um, and uh, some, some advice was given. Try taking 10 years off your CV. Try to that, do what? Take 10 years off oh, your right. CV. Yeah. And, and that made a, made a big difference. So that's just one of the practical examples um, of, of some of the, the situations women are finding themselves in. And um, I'm aware that you set up a commission a number of years ago on women. And I just wonder, can you talk to us about where some of that's going or where, it's, where you hope it's going? And, and secondly, can we make some links? Because I'm really struck with your um, reference to sisterhood across the border. And I think that if we make if we talk together, surely we have a much better chance of, of having more impact. Because these, 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 the, the barriers are some of the barriers you, we've been talking mm. about earlier today, and they're not going away. They're more endemic than ever. Well, I'm very um, supportive of and in admiration of the Scottish Convention on Women. And in fact, I've been to one of the meetings here, which was absolutely packed of the Scottish Convention on Women. One I was struck by the amazing diversity of there was like women from the Scottish Country Women's Association, there was like refugee groups. It was a fantastic example of solidarity and women working together. And yes, we are much stronger if we work together. And I think, you know, without anybody having to think it defines where they are on the question of independence, we should actually make a resolution to really work together, irrespective of what people think on, on the independence issue. But the point you make about we set up a commission on um, older women, Fiona McTaggart, MP, and I, um, because I'm not sure, actually, taking 10 years off your um, uh, CV really does the trick, and this is why. Because I think that, that as a woman in relation to work, you are never in your prime. As a man in relation to work, you are always in your prime. And I've thought it's like there's three ages of women and three ages of men. So basically, when you are a young man, you are full of promise, thrusting forward, one to watch, and you're sort of in your prime, youthful and um, ambitious. As a young woman, you're distractingly pretty and uh, regarded as a bit ditzy. Um, 
and just altogether too pretty and attractive and distracting. Then, when you get a bit older, he has got, you know, three children, reassuringly virile, a solid family man, somebody who can be relied on at work. Um, she's got three children. Oh, my God, she's got far too much on her plate. So he's in his prime again as a family man. She's got too much on her plate. And then when they're older, um, you know, 50s, um, it's like 50s or 60s, he is wise, authoritative, experienced, mature, a bit George Clooney or David <laughs> Dimbleby, attractive, uh, in his prime again. And we're past it. And it's like, God damn it, they've had their prime three times. When is ours? And I think that... Um, <laughs> I think that we have to challenge everything at all ages. But um, the irony is that women who are older, whose children uh, have left home, so they've got more time, they've got more experience, they know stuff. Um, it is absolutely incredible how discriminated, the double discrimination against older women. And we did a survey for the Older Women's Commission which looked at women um, in the broadcasting industry. And young women in front of the camera and young men are on equal terms, 50-50, in terms of broadcasting. But once women get over 50, they literally disappear. It's almost like um, the viewers have to be protected from the awful sight of an older woman in case something terrible happens to them if their eyes fall on an older woman. And... Uh, so we, we raised this and the, we've pushed this with the broadcasters and some of the younger women broadcasters, or at least women who were sort of in their 40s, were going, fantastic, this might give me an extra 10 years of broadcasting because the other alternative is for women to try and make themselves look younger all the time. You know, we don't want to have to make ourselves look younger in order to be valuable. You know, our creases are our experience, which counts for something. So we shouldn't have to be pretending what we're not. One company, I mean, they were all very good at giving the information. One broadcasting company was late um, giving in their information to me. So my office chased them up and they said, oh, do you mind if we give our information next week? And my assistant said, why? And they said, well, because we have got one woman and she's 49, but it's her birthday next week. So we can fill in the form that we've got one. So, you know, and then the BBC Director General came on the radio and all this was being put to him as well as various other things. And he said, no, no, we know we've got to do, um, we've got to do some stuff on this. We're going to go out looking for older women. It's like they are there in your organisation growing older. All you have to do is you don't have to go out and look for them. You have to stop culling them when they actually get to be 50. So there's a lot of work to be done about older women including that we don't mind our age. You know, I am 67. There's nothing wrong with being me at 67. I am different than me at 37, but not better or worse. So when people say, oh, and they're trying to be nice, you look much younger than 67, I always abuse them and say, and so what is wrong with looking 67? <laughs> so we've got to be quite militant about it, I think, but I'm sure you already are. We've, we've got a couple of questions here. Just before I bring in, I, I just want to ask you about, about journalism again, because again, in your book, you talk about the misogyny in, in, in your upbringing or in, in the law, in, in politics, but you also talk about it in journalism and, and just how difficult it was for you to get stories into the press through a, through a battery of male uh, political journalists. And then if you bring us right up to date now, despite the fact we've got four, far more female journalists, we've got situations where someone like Laura Kunzberg actually has to supposedly get an escort to be safe at a Labour Party conference. I mean, that surely can't be right. Well, I think there's two, two issues there. Uh, one is whether or not it's ever acceptable for a, a woman journalist, or indeed any journalist, to feel that when they're doing their job of reporting, that they somehow need protecting for doing what is an important job. And I think that is never acceptable. Um, but the other is the question of how um, women are reported and, and the question of the public domain. And when I was first an MP, there was no television 
uh, in Parliament and there was no radio in Parliament. It was all about the reporting from the press lobby, which was this elite core of political reporters who were allowed into this gallery in the House of Commons. And that was the only way that Parliament was reported. And they were 95% men. And they were not interested in the agenda of the women's movement, which I was putting forward. They didn't think it was anything to do with politics. You know, domestic violence or childcare or maternity leave were not political issues. You know, if I'd have been talking about the mines or the money supplies or motorways or something, then they would have reported it. But now, actually, there is much more diversity and you can tweet and everything like that. But with that then comes the ability for the backlash, which there always is against any progression, Aggressive movement to find channels in to try and silence women who are speaking by vilification and misogyny and abuse in social media. So I think that the work that Yvette Cooper is doing on the Home Affairs Select Committee, putting pressure on the internet service providers, is going to be very important indeed to stop misogyny um, on the internet. And um, I think in the Labour Party, what I'd like to see, and which I've proposed to Jeremy Corbyn, is that we have a rule which is that you can either do, you know, misogynistic abuse of women in public office, or you can be a member of the Labour Party, but you can't be both. And that there should be a one strike and you're out rule. Because we can't have a situation where members of our own party are abusing women online. And there's loads of men who I think will think more carefully before they tap that um, post icon um, if they think that as a result they'd be out of the Labour Party. And nobody needs to do their politics by misogyny and abuse. So there's a whole range of issues there. Okay. I've got another question just there. Yes, um, I was really struck when we were talking about Harvey Weinstein because... Hey, would you mind just moving the microphone towards oh, you a bit? There? Sorry. I was really struck by the fact that you, sir, said you were shocked by the Harvey Weinstein situation, but I think any woman in this room, especially who's worked in a male-dominated professional society, would say it's not shocking at all. What I am shocked by are the number of women that I've spoken with who are blaming the victims for not speaking up and are saying that this is why it continues to happen. What I would ask of you, Ms. Harmon, is how do we work together to stop blaming women for being treated in this way because it is an endemic issue across multiple organizations and industries and just in life in general for women. And, but I think when women blame each other, whether as feminist or saying they're not feminist, we're making it so much harder and we're making it to continue to be a problem that grows. So what do you suggest for us to stop blaming each other? How do we get to that point because it's a really frustrating place to be to hear women blamed for this. Well, I think that's a very important point you made and really it's about women's solidarity with other women as being absolutely essential to being the only way that women will make progress and that was something very much at the heart of the women's movement as it started off. It used to be the idea was that women were rivalrous with each other uh, because they were in competition, of course, for the best husband. So basically, there was no sense of women's solidarity at all. Women were all, like, scratching each other's eyes out, and there was a whole sort of language around the idea of women's rivalry. Um, and I remember, actually, when my, my sister was applying for a job as a lawyer at a time when, actually, uh, it was before the Sex Discrimination Act, you could um, uh, decide not to interview women uh, and advertise for, for men only. And um, she was applying for a job in the law and uh, she rang up this firm because she knew that they'd had a woman solicitor in this firm. And uh, um, she, they said, no, you can't come for an interview. And she said, why not? And they said, because you're a woman. And she said, but you've got a woman solicitor. And they said, yeah, that's right, because... Um, we've already got one, and if you come, you, you'd only fight. And this was the idea that women were rivalrous, and the whole point about the women's movement, it introduced the notion of solidarity amongst women to make progress. And we have to keep reminding ourselves and each other that actually women do have to stand together. Um, and I have been absolutely dismayed by hearing the women on the radio who... Uh, talk about the fact that it's women's fault and why don't women just stand up and speak out and the solution is women being stronger. That is not the solution. The solution is actually holding men to account. And sadly, you know, I was not at all shocked by this Harvey Weinstein thing. 
disgusted, dismayed, appalled, sympathetic to the victims, but I'm afraid not surprised, and nor should we think it's anything other than endemic here, and that's why we have to have the whistle blowing or something like that. So female solidarity is what needs to happen. And also the other thing is that you get to be quite popular with men if you criticise other women. And it's what we used to call false consciousness. And so therefore, um, if you speak out um, against other women, you can immediately get on the radio or on television and get promoted at work. Um, and what used to happen in the early days uh, in the House of Commons is that it's like I was pushing for uh, more women to be on the shadow cabinet um, in the Labour Party, and the men were absolutely furious and felt that this was a, you know, a constitutional outrage. And uh, even though we were going to add to the shadow cabinet, we weren't going to take any men's seats, we were going to add some women's seats, but this was regarded as absolutely dreadful. And therefore, when we came to the shadow cabinet elections, the one woman they were all going to make sure did not get on the shadow cabinet was me, because they wanted people who were not going to be pushing for change. So, you know, we have got to think about our sisterly credentials all the time and work to support each other. Can I just ask, does that not... I mean, you, you, you want to show solidarity with other women, but in politics you have to show solidarity across a range of issues, particularly in the Labour Party. So, for example, how would your solidarity... Which side would you come down? In, in your book, you, you talked about, at one point, very funny, actually, shielding your... hiding your baby from Thatcher's horrific knees, I think it was... So, this, so we've got other women in Parliament, and Mrs Thatcher being you know, one of the most notable. Um, do you, did you view her as a sister? Did you view her as part of the women's movement at all? Well, absolutely not. You know, we'd... we'd um, uh, and I'll mention about Theresa May as well, because basically it's like, you know, we'd campaign for women's advance, and horror of horror, who should be the first woman Prime Minister but a Conservative? And not just any old Conservative, Margaret Thatcher. So we immediately just marched in the streets, the first lady puts women last, and, you know, we were just in no doubt that although it is good for a woman to get into a very high position, the issue is not just you symbolically being there, the question is what you do for other women. And the point that you mention in the book is that, um, is that which basically, well, shows two things, how actually very, very tribal we were, rightly so, against what Margaret Thatcher was doing, which was ruining the country and making people's lives a misery, uh, but also how slightly bonkers I probably was after I'd had my first baby and, indeed, my subsequent babies. So I was, like, walking down a corridor, and it was a very late vote, and very unusually I had a quite newborn baby with me, my first son. And I saw Margaret Thatcher down a very, very long end of the corridor, sweeping down towards me with sort of two aides on either side, sweeping along. And I could see that she'd spotted the baby. And I had this awful moment that I thought somehow that I had to protect this precious and beautiful <laughs> baby from her gaze falling upon it, almost like the baby would shrivel up if <laughs> Margaret Thatcher's eyes were on it. And that is so opposite from the normal notion. Normally, when you've got an absolutely perfect baby, which my baby was, obviously, <laughs> you want people to admire the baby. Uh, but actually, our visceral loathing of Margaret Thatcher for all the awful things she was doing in the country, not least to my constituents, put her on, you know, exactly the other side. So I literally pulled the blanket over his face and dived into a room off the corridor. So, so we were not in any way seeing Margaret Thatcher as a sister. And actually, Theresa May is of the Margaret Thatcher type of ilk. She is not a daughter of the women's movement in any way, shape or form. And um, she voted against the Equality Act. And when we were pushing for more women in Parliament, and our own side, the men, were like poo-pooing it and saying what matters is merit, not, you know, whether you wear a skirt type of thing. Um, she would always be wheeled out by the Tory party to say this was political correctness gone mad. And she sided with the men in her party and the men in our party to do us down. And I'm afraid I can remember that. She might have tried to reinvent herself as somebody who supports women, but she, she never actually did. And she is in a parlous state now. I cannot begin to describe to you 
the open hostility and contempt with which her own side are treating her at the moment. And kind of common humanity would make you possibly feel really sympathetic to see somebody in such an awful position, but I'm afraid I cannot muster any common humanity because of what she is actually doing now, let alone what she's done in the past. You know, so I would feel it easier to have sympathy with her if she'd ever shown any sympathy to the people who are absolutely struggling because they're not getting their universal credit payments to, you know, all the problems that there are. So... Um, do, you, do you think she's being harsher treated more harshly because she's a woman? Would, would a man in her situation be, be treated the same way? I think the harshness of the situation takes a different tone, uh, but I think that altogether um, she's just making an absolute mash-up of the whole thing and the price will be paid by the country. But there are actually, disturbingly for me, uh, and slightly bewilderingly, there are some Tory women MPs who are daughters of the women's movement, I would say, who do believe in solidarity, who are concerned about domestic violence, who do push for childcare. But what I think about them, and they kind of like try and hang out with me. And so I'm like walking down and I suddenly realize that somebody's coming to sit and chat to me and they're a Tory MP. And, but what I feel about them is that they are in the wrong party. <laughs> that is the problem with them. Um, and, it's very confusing for me because, like, you know, if I chat to them and said to one woman, you know, what brought you into politics and, you know, how are you enjoying it here and how are you getting on here and what brought you into politics? And then this woman said, you did. And I was like, but I didn't mean to bring you in as a Tory MP. <laughs> it's like, but actually there are, and that's a really a sign of the women's movement's progress, that actually it's become more of a cultural norm. I mean, they still, you know, regard regulation, which is rights at work, like maternity leave, as a burden on business. They're still cutting public services, which women work in and particularly depend on. So the policies are still all completely wrong, but actually there are quite a few new, younger women Tory MPs who there is nothing wrong with except for the fact that they're in the wrong party. Uh, you... you uh... Until very recently, we had uh, the leaders of the three main parties in Scotland were all women. And you've commented about Nicola uh, Sturgeon. Do you know Ruth Davidson well enough to talk about her as, as a feminist or not? Um, I don't actually, I, I, well, I haven't actually met Ruth Davidson, um, but um, she obviously, you know, puts forward the feminist argument. But, you know, if you believe in a fair and equal society, if you value public services and believe in tackling inequality, why would you be in the Conservative Party? This is what I would say to Ruth Davidson if I, if I met her. Um, she normally sits just here. Oh, right. right. Yeah. Sort of, yeah. Sort of. uh, can I ask, actually, just... But I think just... a sign of the fact that the Labour Party, paradoxically, in a rather, you know, in my bitter and twisted way, is that the, the Labour Party, um, the more power there is the more fierce the fight for it is, and therefore the more women get pushed out and there's a, like a thicket of men competing on anything. And therefore when a party is like in, when the Labour Party is in dire straits in Scotland, women have the opportunity to lead it. And I thought to myself, well, we can tell the Labour Party's on the way up now because we're gonna have a male leader again. But perhaps that's a bit too, yeah. bitter and twisted and paradoxical <laughs> and I'm sure they'll be absolutely marvellous but it is true that it is, it is easier for women to lead things which are absolutely embroiled in turmoil and having real difficulty than when things are all going swimmingly and going uphill then suddenly uh, the women get pushed out of the way. Just before I bring that question around, um, well, you're not disappointed when, when General Corbyn became leader and, and he announced his cabinet, for example, he, he got himself in big trouble on, on women's issues in the sense that he was uh, quoted as, well, the, his conversations were overheard, the first announcements were all male, and then they had to respond by appointing Angela Eagle, or it seemed that way. Um, he was then, I think he had a, a policy at one point, he was talking about women-only carriages and trains and such like. It, it, he's not, I mean, for a party that's so committed to driving the equality agenda, and, and Jeremy himself being clearly off the left, do you think there's a, a problem there when it comes to women? Well, 
there's an issue about um, the left and the fight for gender equality. Um, I, I think that all inequality is bad. All of it's unfair. All discrimination is bad, whether it's based on class, which is obviously a huge issue, whether it's based on race, whether it's based on age or sexual orientation. Um, and I think that we have to fight across the piece on inequality and not regard one sort of inequality as intrinsically more important than another. So there might be somebody who would be campaigning for rights and equality for people with disabilities. And I wouldn't like say to them, well, what about women? Or, well, actually, what is far more important is inequality based on social class. Um, you know, you're somehow dealing with something which is less important. I think we should have no hierarchy in relation to the fight on inequality. All inequality is bad, and anybody who's fighting inequality, that is a good thing. And we've got enough problems dealing with people who are in favour of inequality without we sort of divide amongst ourselves. But on the left, there had often been the view that arguing for equality in relation to tackling inequality in gender was somehow a diversion and a distraction from the class struggle. Um, and the kind of traditional left view was that that was all that was mattered and somehow talking about women was a diversion. And Jeremy Corbyn came from that and dwelt in the traditional left, like the campaign group, where issues of race discrimination or the environment or any of these new movements were not regarded, well, were regarded as a distraction. Now, you know, to his credit, he has definitely, you know, a, moved into embracing all of these issues absolutely massively. So um, I think that any leader needs to know that they've got support for more progress and that will be... Um, you know, called up if they, uh, if they slip back. Um, but I think that, you know, he's well on his way forward on these issues as, you know, as he is across the piece, really. Much to my surprise, I have to say, because, you know, I, I had thought before the 19... Um, the 2017 election that um, he would lead our party to having even fewer votes. And I really overestimated Theresa May, which she obviously did the same, um, and I underestimated Jeremy Corbyn and, um, and was really delighted to discover how wrong I was after we got that um, election result. So um, I think we're making good, good progress. That's why we won't have an election if the Tories can help it. Right. Yeah. We're just there, yes, yes, yeah. There we go. I just wanted to pick up on the point about the gender pay gap. Um, I work with an organisation called Women's Enterprise Scotland, and we see the gender pay gap as a huge issue because in enterprise, um, the pay gap is much greater and it seems to be a growing trend. In employment, the, the pay gap at the UK is 18%, but I heard utterly shocking data just the other day which says that in self-employment, there are more women coming into self-employment, but the pay gap in self-employment now stands at 33%. That is almost double the gender pay gap in employment, which is horrific. And for us, the research and information that we're gathering and picking up, some of this has its roots in the benefits changes that adversely impact the proportions of women, and also in the excellent point that was made earlier around women facing um, ageist issues in employment and also being first in the firing line when redundancy strikes. So in an economic climate at the minute, you know, what we are seeing is a migration of women who have less opportunity to make an income coming into self-employment and facing severe barriers and challenges in trying to work hard to make a decent income. Well, I think that's a really, that, really is the question. <laughs> um, I think that is a really, really uh, important point. And I think a lot of women go to self-employment because the, the traditional workplace will not accommodate the flexibility they need 
for caring for their children or caring for older relatives or supporting a relative with disabilities. So that a lot of women wanting to work but not being able to find a satisfactory situation end up um, in self-employment. And I think that one of the things that's really important is the transparency about the pay gap, which is going to be workplace by workplace. And here, I think there is a massive job for the public authorities, but there is also a job for the trade union movement. Because once it's like appears in a, a, a workplace where there is trade union recognition, but it's shown that the pay gap is like 30%, that is a real challenge to the negotiators to analyse what is lying behind that and tackle those obstacles, which will often be about, you know, part-time workers being discriminated against and not being able to uh, get the training or to get the promotion in an organisation. Um, and I think it's also very important that the Equality and Human Rights Commission and the equivalent um, bodies in Scotland make the issue of um, uh, really promulgating workplace by workplace pay gaps so that people are confronted with it and then are forced to, to, to have a plan of action to tackle it. I think that that's very, very, very important indeed because the whole point of having this information is that it should enable us to have the power uh, to challenge it. Because in the past, everybody said, pay gap's a terrible thing, but it doesn't happen here. Well, it actually does. And so it's going to be the moment of truth. But the main thing is to keep the data simple because the more people can produce 16 metrics of measuring inequality, the more people can't quite get, get to grips with it. So it's like average hourly pay that is the key thing. It has to be hourly because you've got to put part-time workers into the equation rather than just measure full-time workers against each other and measure part-time workers against each other because, of course, most women, for at least some of the time, are working part-time. And there's another question just up. Uh, yes. women's rights I think my accent might let you know that I'm from Belfast in Northern Ireland and women are really not progressing very far very fast back home but to declare an interest I am elected as well I'm a recently elected MLA to the Northern Ireland Assembly that is dysfunctional at the minute as well but I'm also a long-term campaigner for abortion rights in Northern Ireland um, and I'd maybe want to talk to you about it, about that as well. Um, I know that Stella Creasy, your colleague, did a phenomenal move very recently um, in getting access to, to free health care for women. But I know that also international bodies such as CEDA have repeatedly um, reported back to Westminster to say that you're not fulfilling your human rights commitments to women in Northern Ireland, that we have had successive court cases who have ruled that our abortion laws are against human rights and given that Westminster are the state body signed up to be compliant with human rights, I was wondering if you could have any insights or anything to say on why the women of Northern Ireland have been left behind since 1967. Well, it's... <laughs> so basically, um, the... Uh, Northern Ireland, for, for those of you who are not aware of this, didn't get the 67 Abortion Act. So it didn't even get that legalisation. It's in a pre-1967 abortion situation. And what Stella Creasy did is for all those women who come over to England because they need an abortion and then were being charged for it and having to pay for it, um, she's got the government to agree that um, women who come over from Northern Ireland to have an abortion um, then don't have to be charged for it by our NHS. But actually, they shouldn't have to come to England uh, to have an abortion. It should be lawful in, um, uh, in Northern Ireland. I think that, the, um, that the, the, it's been sort of beset by the sense of the importance of allowing... Uh, Northern Ireland, its own, you know, self-determination and its own elected representatives to make that decision, which then is challenged by the idea of um, uh, the overarching human rights that ought to be universal um, and not something which a devolved administration can opt out of. 
And um, that was something that very often when we were in government, I would be struggling with. Um, and, um, but always warned, you know, if you do this, it will bring the government down, you know, and there's always that, um, that other threat. So um, I'm hoping that following the, the, the work that we all backed Stella Creasy up on, that we will be able to, you know, make some, some further progress on that. And it is an irony because in so many ways, the equality movement, which was about challenging sectarianism, was so pioneering in Northern Ireland under the uh, peace process with the Equal Opportunities, Equal Employment Opportunities Commission. I mean, a whole structure happened in Northern Ireland, which was way in advance um, to deal with positive action in job opportunities for people from either sides of the religious divide. So it is an irony that the gender equality is left behind on all of that. It's, it's, I mean, given the political reality of the moment that the, the Conservative government is supported by the DUP and the, the majority is reliant, is that, does that hold out the prospect of any progress in this issue? Well, I think that, um, I mean, it was a bit, uh, there was analogies in relation to uh, the situation of, of, of women in Scotland where everybody would be told, well, uh, you know, you metropolitan London women, you don't understand it, actually. Um, women in Scotland don't want to be um, having this advance um, or that advance. And um, so that's another reason why for there to be solidarity across these, um, across these boundaries. Um, I remember once when we were arguing for, m there, was, there was only, um, uh, there was no women in the North uh, in representation, in Labour representation in Parliament for a long period. And when I was arguing with one of my colleagues and saying there needs to be, you know, the voice of women from the North needs to be heard, North of England. Um, and him, he's saying, uh, but you, you, you're just a London woman. You don't understand. Women in the North don't want to be in Parliament. You know, they don't want to be involved in politics. And somebody else said, there aren't actually women in the North in the Labour Party. And it's like, I knew that wasn't true. So I think in a way, it's also about us supporting our sisters in different parts of the country to be like driving the advance. Um, well, a couple more questions, just right here. Yeah. I just, um, first of all, I wanted to um, applaud you for everything you've done um, for young women like myself who are interested in politics. Um, but I just wanted to ask you, you talked about women um, often being pushed out um, and I think gender's often left out of the narrative. I just wondered what you thought. Um, um, do you think that there's a sense of women on the right being alienated from feminism and from um, the issues because they simply have a different view? Alienated from feminism, women yes. on the right. Um, well, feminism is intrinsically a progressive movement because it's about challenging the status quo and it's about challenging the unequal distribution of power and income. And, um, and, and therefore, there is a mismatch between um, feminism and, and, and the right wing, basically. Um, so I don't think it's anything that we're doing that is alienating women on the right. It's just that if women want to be part of progress and cognize the progress that has been made, then they need to stop being on the right. <laughs> you know, it's like... <laughs> and there's a woman just, where's where she gone? I've got my eye here. Oh, there you are, yes. Um, my eye is going, there we are. Um, s s slight preamble to my question, given that you talked about um, Theresa May and Mrs. Thatcher. Um, I think there are probably lots of people in the room who had the same visceral horror and contempt as I did at the one show thing about boys' jobs and girls' jobs. But in a week in which a journalist has been murdered in Malta, I was two weeks ago at a day conference about trafficking. The woman journalist who made that programme is one of the most remarkably courageous journalists I've had the privilege to meet. However, perhaps unlike Laura Kunzberg, she did need genuine protection. One person on a bus traveling from Eastern Europe to London on more than one occasion 
She had one bodyguard with her in the bus, who was Romanian. She had another, who is British, in a vehicle behind. Such was the danger that they felt she was in. Her insurance company, hearing about the program, have raised her personal insurance for £360 a month. And very gently, I think I might defy you to say that that perhaps is a woman journalist who needs protection. And to get then to my question, which is trafficking, could you share your views on human trafficking and what as a society we need to do about that different abuse of power, predominantly by men? Um, well, I think that it is a terrible thing, you know, and that woman who was murdered in Malta was, you know, absolutely, you know, tragic and awful um, and is a, is a shame on Malta. It's cast an absolute, you know, shame on them that that could happen in this day and age and um, but I also think that we shouldn't not think it's important for a journalist to feel that they can't just go around at a party conference without feeling that they've got to have somebody to kind of ward off anybody who should be abusive I don't think we should necessarily not be concerned about one because another is so much more uh, life-threatening and the thing that you describe about the the trafficking is is because it's serious organized crime and the commodity there is not drugs or guns the commodity is human beings and a lot of it is the commodity is women being trafficked for sex um, and I remember when I first heard the phrase human trafficking which was when actually we were in um, we were part of the G20 having our... Um, uh, oh, no, it was when we were president of the uh, European Union for that happy days, that was, when we held the presidency of the European Union and we were having a conference, a Women's Ministers of Europe conference in Belfast, and the women ministers from the rest of Europe were talking about the problem of uh, human trafficking. And um, uh, one of the things that I think is needed to help stop the awful trade in human trafficking is of, of women for sex, is to prosecute the men who have sex with them. Because the women are not consenting. They are not actually getting money for having sex. They are enslaved. And uh, when I was Solicitor General, which is responsible for um, prosecutions, so many cases would cross my desk where um, there would be a, a victim of human trafficking and they would like um, rescue the woman, they would arrest the pimps and the traffickers, but they would have bins full of used condoms, full of DNA material. And I'd be like, why are you not actually getting this material? Why are you not prosecuting the men? This is actually rape. Um, because often the women would say, we would tell the man that we would uh, that we were um, uh, you know trafficked and enslaved here and ask for help to escape and that they would always just carry on and insist on on having sex with them except one man in one case who didn't go on to have sex with the woman but he didn't help her escape um, so I think that we have to look at the demand side of human trafficking for sex you know, the supply side, yes, as well, but we need to um, recognise that, that if there wasn't a sort of pseudo-respectability um, or at least a prevalence of men thinking that somehow it's all right for them to use women for sex um, if they pay, uh, then it wouldn't be happening. And that's one of the, or at least it would, you know, cut it right down, that's one of the reasons why I think that I'm so against... Uh, legalising, if you like, or regularising what is called sex work, because I think for the microscopic small number of women who choose to sell their bodies for sex, whereby it is a properly free choice, not a choice imposed on them by alcohol addiction or drug addiction or mental health problems um, or being trafficked and being enslaved, for that infinitesimal number of women who would choose to be doing it, I would rather sacrifice their right to be a sex worker for the sake 
of protecting all those women who are not in that situation through their choice, but are actually horribly, horribly abused. So that's why I don't even like the term sex work. I'm conscious we're, we're just coming to an end here, but uh, before we do, there's a couple of questions I just wanted to throw to you. One is just uh, on, on legislation that's currently before us or issues that are still to be tackled. Um, uh, in the news this week in Scotland, um, the, the Green Party, Labour Party and SNP have all signed up to ban smacking in the House. Totally in favour of that. You are, totally right. in favour of that. Do you think we should have progress at Westminster? I think that's... Yeah, and I think it will happen because of what you've done here in Scotland. Um, it's more likely to, to, make, it, uh, to make it possible. Um, I think it's long overdue. I was, by the way, you mentioned the European Union. I thought we were going to get through the whole thing without mentioning Brexit, which is... Yes. <laughs> do, do you have any... I mean, do you despair? I think most of us do, not just politicians who discuss it endlessly. Do you despair at what's happening at the moment, or do you see... You, because you're quite optimistic. I'm actually struck by how optimistic you are about so many issues. Are you optimistic about Brexit too, despite being a Remainer? Uh, I think it is absolutely catastrophic what's happening at the moment. And the fact that it is brought the Tory party to its knees. It's so bad what is happening to the country that I can't even enjoy the prospect of the Tory party. <laughs> that's, that's how bad it is. And I think, you know, people will pay a price for what is going on with this. And it will not be people who've got plenty of houses and loads of money. It will be, as always, people, you know, who are younger, starting in, out in life, who've got less resources. But I think if you work, if you think of where we are at the moment, I mean, the big thing is to get a trade agreement we need an agreement because like 40% plus of our trade is with the European bloc. We absolutely need that agreement. We can't even start talking about it until we've sorted out three issues. One is the question of um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the EU migrants. And we can't sort that out because obviously the migrants' rights need to be protected by the European Court of Justice. And that has... Um, become a huge um, red line for the Tory party. So that is like very difficult intractably. The next one that is very difficult intractably is that they won't get on to talk about trade because they will not do anything which is going to destabilise the border. Well, that is very intractable. The border between Ireland and, and Northern Ireland, that's very intractable. And the other is they won't talk about trade until we've sorted out the question of the money. And you can just see today is that Boris Johnson is saying it's not going to be acceptable for even one penny to go, for example, to our obligations we've entered un into, like paying Nigel Farage's pension and things like that. So basically, these are three huge obstacles before we even get to discuss trade. And the idea that we can just have no deal is absolutely unbelievable um, sort of political grandstanding slash self-harm in the most extraordinary way. And I, we, they called us Remainers Project Fear. And actually, what we were saying was not the half of it. So um, I feel that uh, really uh, we've got to reset the process on this. Um, but there is no chance of doing that whilst we still um, have a Conservative government, unfortunately, ironically, yeah. So David Cameron, I think, for agreeing to a referendum to go into his manifesto, because he thought he'd never have to implement it, because he thought there'd be a coalition and that the Lib Dems would then not let them implement it so they could say, OK, well, it was in our manifesto, but we're not going to implement it because the Lib Dems won't let us. That was, like, unprincipled and lazy, and he should never have done that because then, of course, he got an overall majority had a referendum and lost it. And I think that's one of the reasons why he will go down as one of the worst prime ministers ever this country's had in history. So I'm going to allow you to end on an op optimistic note, if I may, though. Just, just uh, uh, a lot of questions on Facebook on this issue as well, which is basically about what the future holds, but for, as saying, uh, uh, from, for young men, for uh, women, Thomas McEachan, Kayleigh Finnegan and Tegan Stevenson about the younger generation and particularly the role that men can play and what progress we can make. And we've got 100 years of women's suffrage coming up next year, so our anniversary. 
do you think, I mean, what progress do you think we can make? Or do you think there's huge battles still to be fought? Do you think the progress, the, the biggest battles have already been won, or do you think there's more to do? I think there is a huge amount more to be done, and I think that we need to look back and be gratified with how much we've been able to do, but not be, like, grateful for it, because actually all we're doing is trying to get a situation where people have op equality rather than inequality and that they face opportunity rather than discrimination. And we are still a very, very long way from that, whether it is social class, whether it's disability, age, gender or race. We are still far from the equal society, which is not only an entitlement of each individual. Why should anybody face discrimination or prejudice because of how or where they're born. So it's not just the entitlement of every individual, but it's also what makes society work better. If people feel strong and empowered and equal, they're more able to be part of a society. And it's also absolutely essential for the economy. So um, for all those reasons, the gap between where we are now and where we need to go, we need to just, you know, regird our loins, if that's not a rather male <laughs> description, um, and, and get there. Incidentally, I've been sitting down while we're doing this talk, but I've been thinking all the time, after I did uh, one of these sessions in a different part of the country, one really nice woman came up to me afterwards and she said, I think you should think about whether or not it's right for you to be sitting down when you do this, because I've just been to a session with Yanis Varoufakis, she said, you know, the Greek uh, former minister, and she said, he strode up and down, like, you know, leaning forward and everything. She said, really, you're probably doing a sort of bit of a sort of gender stereotype model crouched in the chair here. So um, perhaps next time I need to be like, so I'm sorry I've been sitting down, but um, next time perhaps I should be striding down around in my leathers like Yanis. In, in a couple of hours we're going to make George Monbiot sit there as well, so you're in good company, so... Uh, you, can I just ask you all to say thank you very much. We, uh, Harriet's going to be make, make herself available shortly in the cafe bar, I believe, to sign copies of uh, her book, A Woman's Work. Uh, but it's been a real pleasure. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much uh, for your time this afternoon, for sharing uh, your insights and uh, your experience. And of thank you, Ken, years. for chairing it as well. Our presiding <laughs> officer presiding wonderfully. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.